Okay, so in talking about digital imaging post-processing, which I believe is chapter 31 in, our, in the text and in, in the reading, um, we've got a big long laundry list of things that we're going to consider. He goes to a great deal of depth on this material. Um, I am telling you right now, please hear me say this, you do not need to necessarily need to think about it to the degree that he is thinking about it. What we need to track in this reading are those bold-faced terms and those things that are in italics. So if you were to look at what I've marked up in my textbook, I've underlined pretty much everything that's in italics, right? And I'm also interested in any time he uses the word example. So I want the definition and I want examples, right? So definitions and examples, as we're reading through this passage, anytime the, the text gets kind of over our, over our heads, which frankly this is for me, I'm just being completely transparent with you. If I'm looking at this and I'm a registry question writer as well, if we're thinking like this as a test maker, not a test taker, the people who are writing your exam tests, they're not computer programmers either. So we can give ourselves a little bit of a pass here. There are people like me who are nerds and we like CT and we like radiation therapy, we like that kind of stuff, but we're not interested in learning Fortran or some computer programming language, right? So what we look at when we look at this text as technologists and as therapists is definitions and we're thinking about what's the clinical application of that, so what's, the, what's an example, right? And then the, the third thing that we might be thinking about is, okay, what kind of problems could result from this? What are places that I might use this in my day-to-day -day life as an x-ray tech or as a therapist to fix pictures, right? Because that, that at the end of the day is the name of the game. So that would be the deeper level of it. So again, the foundational knowledge is gonna be definitions and examples, which I've said the definitions are in italics, the examples, he just says an example of this is. So that's what I have starred and underlined in my, in my textbook. And then to think about the application part of it, it's really gonna require you to think about your clinical experience. The textbook doesn't necessarily point it out, but you have experienced some of these things in your clinical life, right? So I'll hit pause from time to time and, and try to get us to get some brain cells running to think about what are things that we've seen out in the clinic that may have been results of, of some of these errors or some of these processing operations we're gonna talk about. So I've got some real simple objectives for us. You'll notice it doesn't, I do not go into the depth that he is um, in this textbook. He's got 19 learning objectives identified. That's crazy, right? There's no way that I can learn 19 in-depth things from a single chapter. But I've broken it down to four. So I've incredibly reduced this down, right, to what is absolutely essential here. We need to be able to define spatial intensity and frequency domains. We'll also talk about global domains, which are kind of a subset of spatial. All of these things can kind of be used interdependently. Um, so at, when I'm making processing calls, um, one of the things that he does in the textbooks is, as he's talking about these domains is he's treating them as separate domains. That is one way to think about them. But from a programming point of view, you can make calls to different domains kind of in a single command, right? So we'll, we'll talk about even maybe some typos in the textbook where it, he didn't make that super clear. Um, but we'll list examples of each of these. So this goes back to that need for definitions and examples. We'll talk about um, the use of gradient processing and as it specifically relates to lookup tables. So we've continued to kind of dance around the term lookup table um, and we'll continue to kind of hash out all of it. But if you, you've probably figured out by now, lookup table is kind of one of those big kind of gorillas in the room type things that we're gonna continue to come back to over and over and over again. And if you're wondering why is the lookup table so important, it is kind of the digital equivalent of contrast. It is, it is the concept that kind of unifies everything. If, we, if we've identified a good lookup table, if we have good algorithms in place, the chances that we're gonna have quality images is that much more likely. So that's why it's so difficult to define. That's why we're gonna spend so much time talking about it. That's why it keeps coming up over and over and over again is because it's directly tied to image quality. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about specifically as it's used to customize image brightness and contrast. Then we'll finally, we'll talk about um, Fourier transformations and as they're used in uh, enhancement. 
And one of the things I wanted to do in talking about this is I, I wanted to bring up um, the artwork of uh, M.C. Escher. I'm a big fan of, of M.C. Escher's art. I think he's very interesting. Um, and I like this image here on the right because, um, like we're talking about these different uh, digital processing domains, spatial intensity and frequency, in this image here we have three different worlds represented, right? Um, which I think is very, very interesting. Um, so we have the world in which the trees exist, right? Um, so that's that uh, world uh, above, the, above the water, right, out in the air. Then we have the world on the ground, right, the world on the surface of the water, right, which is where the, where the leaves are resting right now. And then we have the world below the surface of the water, which is where the fish is. All three of those different domains, if you will, are represented on the single image, right? So we're going to use this image to look at different processing um, algorithms that we can apply to it. But the spatial domain, if I was going to talk about what the spatial domain is, he says that it is defined as sorting the image by location, right? Location of the pixels in space. Right, so uh, um, examples of the kinds of sorting that can happen in the spatial domain um, is any kind of zoom or magnification, right? Um, you might be wondering, okay, well, how does that change uh, the representation of pixels in space? Well, let's, let's zoom in. I'm going to uh, escape out of this picture here. I'm going to zoom in on the image itself. I'm holding down control, and I'm going to zoom in on the picture. And you'll notice as I'm zooming in, the picture's moving over, right? Because already I can see it's reorienting itself in space, right? It's changing, for, in another way of talking about it, is like it's taking a pixel that only existed at this tiny space, and now it's saying you should exist in three spaces. Zoom in a little bit more, that pixel should exist in five spaces. Zoom in a little bit more, and that pixel should exist in ten spaces. So it's a, it's a, pa it's a spatial operation. It's changing um, the orientation of the pixels in space. So that is probably the most commonly used um, spatial operation that we that we use. But beneath um, spatial do beneath the spatial domain, you, you can think about it as being like an umbrella. And there's at least three other concepts that exist underneath that spatial domain. It's um, point processing, right? An example of that point processing is the uh, um, I want to make sure I got this right. <laughs> it's any time I'm subtracting a value from a specific pixel within the within the uh, within the the picture. Um, area processing. An example of that area processing again is zooming in and zooming out, right? And then finally, global processing. Uh, and he kind of stumbles a little bit in talking about global processing, right? I want to point that out, that there's a typo here in our textbook, um, at least in this text that I'm looking at, when he starts talking about kernels. Um, I, I would not necessarily think about kerneling as being a, a form of global spatial processing. Uh, they are more generally thought about as frequency processing, happening within frequency processing. But to be safe, uh, this global processing has to do with massive spatial, spatial operations. So an example of a, a, a global uh, spatial operation is going to be image translation. And we'll get more into this, but it's basically flipping the image across any axis. If I rotate the image or if I flip it across the x or y axis, that would be a global uh, process. Intensity has to do with sorting the values based on their gray level stored in each pixel. So if you immediately thought about bit depth, you're, head, you're heading in the right direction. It's basically sorting based on what amount of gray was stored for that bit's bit depth, right? So we can do all sorts of operations to subtract out a certain color of gray or a certain color of black um, to change the image. Finally, frequency uh, domain is probably the most confusing because if you think about it, we're spatial creatures. We think about things in space all the time. Like even as you're sitting there at, at, your, at your desk or at your, your, your chair, you're thinking about the, where things are in relationship to you. Your brain is, is aware of that and processing that. We're also aware of how intense things are. We know if a dark room is dark or if it's light or whatever. We're aware of intensity levels. Frequency is not something that we readily perceive. Right? 
Um, an example of being aware of frequency is like, I don't know if you ever played the, the game Slug Bug in the, in the car. Like anytime you drive past a Volkswagen, you get punched in the shoulder or something. That would be something happening in the frequency domain. The more and more, the more, and more your shoulder starts to bruise, the more and more Volkswagens you must be seeing, right? And your, your older brother is that much quicker than you or whatever. So that's something that we're not as aware of, how things, frequency of things occurring um, might be impacting our surroundings, right? It's, it's more something that computers are aware of, and so we'll talk more about it. But let's get down to the, the nitty gritty of the spatial domain operations. So I've said that they can be brought down into, into three further classifications. The first being point processing, something done point by point. A great example of this is subtraction. So I've taken our original image here and I've subtracted out the lower half, right? Now I did it in a really cheesy way. We don't generally crop things in this way, but all I did was just apply this blue block so that you could see what area was subtracted, right? But you do this probably all the time. You crop uh, like a selfie or whatever. You are doing a point by point process. You might not be thinking, well, I need to point process this picture, but that's what you're doing, right? Um, so Anytime you see uh, point processing or if you have a question on the registry, you're thinking about what's happening as I crop these images, it is applying a, a point processing which is again happening within the spatial domain. Area processing, the example that we had of that is zooming, right? We've already looked at that pretty much in depth. But a selected area is going to be reassigned values based on its location. We're just going to spread those locations out until they get bigger and bigger. And that's going to make it apparent that we're getting closer and closer to the picture. Right? Global processing are those really big operations that happen across the entire image. And so I've got an example of a global operation there in the lower pictures. That is an image translation. Right? I took the image and I flipped it over one of the axes. What axis did I flip it over? This picture right here. The y-axis. So I just took the picture and I, I told it, based on where you're at on this side of the y-axis, I want you to be the same distance from the y-axis on the other side. And it did that across the entire image. It's, it's a massive operation and that it in, incorporated the entire image. If there was a portion of it that wasn't flipped, that would be immediately apparent, right? It would make a jumbled picture. So it has to do that accurately. Now, um, in terms of like thinking uh, critically about this, I'm going to pause the recording here. Okay, intensity uh, domain operations are again something that I've said that are readily apparent to the eye. Um, we sometimes have a more difficult time uh, putting it into words how the picture has changed. And so I made some really uh, remarkable changes to these pictures. Um, and these specifically fit within the concept of gradient processing. Now, for those of us who are, are in MRI, don't think about MRI gradients when I say the word gradient, okay? MRI gradients are a totally different thing. Um, what I'm talking about is the gradation of grays um, or whites and blacks, right? It, um, another way to talk about it is it's the steepness of that H and D curve. Um, and so if you look in your reading, we have that characteristic curve, that kind of S-shaped curve. And I said that the straight line portion of that curve represents what part of the image? You remember? The straight portion of the H and D curve represents what part of the picture? Someone take a guess at anything. We're close. It's very closely related to brightness. It's changes in brightness, which is what we call contrast. So let me, let me pause this real quick. So these are shifts that we can perceive with the eye, right? Um, we sometimes struggle with putting them into words, so it's helpful to have graphical representations of them. The graphical representation that the computer will frequently rely on is the histogram, right? And it will apply things like gradient curves to the histogram. Um, but it's also to look at it in the picture itself and be able to identify it there. So intensity domain operations are things that happen regardless of location, 
the pixels are going to be sorted based on individual values. So an example of this is the histogram analysis stuff that we talked about last week, as well as any kind of gradient processing. So I'm kind of doing a pivot here. We talked last week about histogram analysis and defining a volume of interest and then changing the picture based on what that volume of interest is. Now we're saying, okay, you've got your volume of interest defined. Within that volume of interest, is there a gradient? Is there a kind of shading that you can apply across that in order for there to be more contrast? or less contrast, or whatever is needed. So gradient processing uses the lookup table to customize grayscale based on the specified anatomy. So for some anatomy, we need less contrast. For other anatomy, we need more contrast, just depending on variables of the patient's anatomy. Classic example of this is the chest. The chest has a high subject contrast because it has air in the lungs and then the bone, right? So the air, lots of x-rays get through it, the bones not so much. So it is a high contrast uh, structure. The lookup tables that we're applying to the chest then are toning the contrast down. They're giving us a more low contrast image as a way to counteract what we're seeing from the patient's anatomy. So these gradient processing, again, in the lookup table defined for chest, it's saying, okay, I want you to go, the anatomy is going to look like this. I want you to do something more like this. I want you to shade it out some. I want you to apply a little bit more shading and apply a little bit more gray to it. Another example of that um, is the abdomen. And that's the kind of, I don't know if it's readily apparent on this picture here, but that's kind of what I've done with these pictures here is I've applied something like a lookup table that might be used for the abdomen. The abdomen's a pretty low contrast structure. There's a lot of guts and fat and all sorts of tissue in the abdomen. There's some bones, maybe a little bit of air, but pretty much every possible attenuation value imaginable is there in the abdomen. So it is a low subject contrast structure. We're going to want to dial the contrast up some. And that's just what I've done with this picture. So in this case, I've taken the original image and I've increased the contrast. And you notice now the leaves really pop. Right? So I'm, I'm defining the leaves better. I can see the fish scales a little bit more clearly. Why? Because it has more contrast. So um, by comparison, I can also mess with the gamma. And this is not gamma like gamma rays. This is, we're trying to be confusing here. So in computer science, when we talk about gamma, um, what we're talking about is basically the window width settings that the radiographer can uh, turn up or turn down at the console. So these are adjustments that the radiographer themselves can make. Um, that's, I will leave gamma at that. If you want examples of what these transformations look like, on um, figure 31-7, you have examples of different gamma operations. Again, these would be user-defined, and it would be the way that the computer's thinking about are changes to window um, width settings. All of these operations are called intensity tra transformations. All of them are called intensity transformations. They're changes in the overall brightness or darkness of the image. Changes to the levels of grays in the image are happening within the intensity domain. I like this image here as an example of gradient processing, and I'll tell you, hint, hint, you will see this picture again, right? Because there's a lot embedded in this picture. Um, so I'll walk us through it one more time, because this is, this is a big takeaway. Um, this is kind of one of those like exclamation point type parts of the course, where I want to make sure we're all comfortable with this and it's not confusing to any of us. Um, what we're talking about when we talk about di uh, gradient processes, processing again is a way to control image contrast, right? I've said that the computer applies lookup tables to shift the gradient, right? If the user starts messing with it, we're going to call that a gamma transformation. But if the computer's doing it, more or less, we can think about it as gradient processing. 
They're basically two sides of the same coin. Just is the computer doing it or is the tech doing it? All of that fits underneath the umbrella of dynamic range, right? The dynamic range of the system is what we're talking about. And dynamic range is just the number of grays that are represented on the picture. Dynamic range is very closely related to contrast. Another way of talking about dynamic range is it is the length of that straight line portion of these curves. So we can look at these picture, this picture here and we can say that as displayed, image L, right, curve L up there, has a shorter dynamic range than image A. Image A has a really broad dynamic range, right? It would be very difficult to see anything on image A, though, because it would be very, very, very low contrast, right? So image L has a much shorter line, therefore, it is a shorter dynamic range. Image A has a longer line, so it has a longer dynamic range. Now, point of fact, though, in terms of what the computer receives, all the information that it gets from the patient looks like line A. If you think about this, it receives just a standard um, set of information that basically could be displayed something like line A or close to line A. It has to apply mathematical operations to make that look like something that, where I can see detail. So it's going to shift line A into something like line L or line E. Now, there are some other weird lines on here. Probably the weirdest line on here is line M, right? And uh, if you're wondering what's happening with line M, the entire intensity has been flipped on its head, right? So an example of this would be something that calls for black bone technique, right? Um, and the classic example of that is fluoroscopy. So um, as I'm looking at these lines, I'm seeing each one of those types of images, right? For line L, I'm seeing an abdomen image that needed that higher contrast in it. Why? Because it's a low contrast piece of anatomy. For line E, I'm seeing a chest x-ray. Why? Because it's a high contrast piece of anatomy. I want the lookup table to be low contrast. I want to stretch that dynamic range out. For line M, I'm seeing a fluoro image. I'm seeing something that was done with black bone technique in order to help with the placement of orthopedic hardware or contrast. Okay? So each one of these lines represents different types of gradient processing. The big takeaway here, though, is that if it's a steep slope, it's a high contrast. If it's a shallow slope, that means low contrast. Any kind of right to left position of the curve changes image brightness. So if I shift the entire curve to the left or to the right, I'm changing brightness. Data clipping can occur if the curve exceeds the bit depth. We see this sometimes in clinic. If you want a graphical representation on it, it's uh, figure um, 3111. This is a case in which we've tried to change the image contrast more than what the number of grays is that we have in our computer, right? And so we wind up clipping some information off. Um, this happens quite a bit, and sometimes we're aware of it, sometimes we're not. Uh, but uh, an example of it would be if you've ever seen a picture where um, it just looks a little bit too dark. Right? But you've got a lot of gray still in the picture, but there's just something about it that's too dark. Chances are we're clipping off a portion of the uh, low attenuation area, right? Um, which is normally fine because that's like air and stuff like that. But uh, any kind of absent details, um, we can't recover them, right? So if, and if in acquiring this picture, th there was not enough p penetration to get through all the anatomy, we can't recover that, right? If it was something that was clipped based on the data or the post-processing, we can recover that, right? Now, I'll, I'll offer you an example of where this is significant, okay? Um, there will be moments when you shoot a picture and the picture you can't see, if you did it, like for example, a water skull and you, the technique appears to be correct, um, but the picture is not there, right? 
it's a silhouette, or there's not enough detail, you can't see everything that you want to see, right? Chances are that information is there in, on the image receptor, but it has not been processed appropriately. So there is not the appropriate amount of intensity domain processing that needed to happen with that. A lot of times it happens if the patient has orthopedic hardware in place or if there's some kind of unexpected metal object. Why? Because it's basing that value and it's making a shift to that value, that metal or whatever. So you can change the operations and recover that information, right? So nine times out of ten, it is not that you didn't get a good picture. It's that the processing operation wasn't applied correctly. That's why we're studying this to such great depth. Because if we can have x-ray techs and therapists out there in the workforce who recognize these errors and kind of think, oh, okay, that's something happening with the gradient. Maybe I can change it with the window width or window level setting and fix it without exposing the patient again. That's a win-win, right? That's why I'm spending so much time talking about this. Okay. Frequency domain operations. Um, so I've said that the previous two things, anything that happens spatial domain, we can kind of orient ourselves in. Intensity domain starts to make sense because we know the difference between a, a light room or in a dark room. Frequency domain is the weird one, right? Um, because we don't generally think about the frequency with which things are happening. Simple way to talk about this is that the image is going to be broken into wave components. Wave components. So we'll take uh, an analog signal like this, uh, this blue thing here on the left, and we're going to break that waveform into all the various waveforms that compose that wave. Right? So there's some shallow waves, there's some long wavelength waves, there's some short wavelength waves. Um, so every possible way you can describe a wave, like amplitude, frequency, and uh, wavelength, we can degrade the wave into these simpler waveforms, right? Now you might be wondering, okay, what on earth is he talking about right now? Well, let's, let's go to the lake, all right, for a second, and let's talk about like tubing. Have most of us been tubing at the lake, right? It matters how big the boat is, right? Um, it matters how close the tube is to the boat. All of those things are factors in the types of waves that are being generated, right? And everyone knows if you really want to get the people off the tube, you cross your own wake or you cross someone else's wake, right? Preferably you cross both. What's happening as we cross those different waves, right? Um, if it was a big boat that went past us and we rode the tube over the wake, right, over the waves from that bigger boat, right, that would be, let's say, a pretty big change in the waveform. The amplitude changed a lot. So the tube goes flying up in the air, right? So big wave, the tube goes flying up in the air. If, though, we passed in front of, behind a canoe, right, Chances are we're not going to knock anyone off of the boat. We might knock the people out of the canoe before we knock the people out of the uh, off the tube, right? Why? Because the, the tubes, the amplitude of the, t of the canoe's wave is not very high. As the, as the canoe is going along, it is not producing a big wave behind it, right? It's not a high amplitude wave. So try to think about these different waveforms as being like the different types of waves that are generated by a boat, right? That's what we're talking about. Um, the rockier the waves are, um, in essence, the more information there is, the richer it is for the computer, and the, the closer we are to having a good time on the tube or whatever, right? That's the way to think about it. So if it's a large, a large object, it's going to have a long wave. It will be a low frequency thing. So the large objects will have a long wave. They will be low frequency. You can think about it as long, Large, long, and low. If it's a small object, it's going to have a short wave and a high frequency, right? So going back to the lake, if I'm thinking about, okay, what is this talking about? 
So if I have a really big boat on the lake, right, like a barge, for some reason a barge is going down the lake, right? Chances are the amount of speed required for the barge to generate is not going to make that big of a wave, right? Like the further away from the barge that I get, those waves are still there, right? But they're not going to be very high waves. They're going to be pretty low waves. So it's, it's a big boat. It's so big that its waves are not that big, right? Versus if I had like five jet skis, right? Five jet skis go flying past me on the lake. They're going to make a whole lot of little tiny waves, right? There's going to be a lot of them, but not, not very high, right? So something to think about. High frequency, but not really big. So um, these Fourier, transform Fourier transformations are going to break those complex waveforms, what's being received by the image receptor from the patient, into all the individual sine waves, right? Um, and it's important to point out these are sine waves, right? So uh, uh, that's about all the math that we need to know about them, but just that they are sine waves, right? They work in a sinusoidal pattern. So the computer then selects which waves to add back to the processed image, right? Um, so if we want the smaller objects to become more clear on the picture, we can subtract out the long wavelengths, because now just the short wavelengths will be there. The high wavelengths will be there. Um, if we want, for whatever reason, to get rid of smaller objects on the picture, we subtract out those short wavelengths, those high frequency wavelengths, and we'll get mostly the larger objects that will show up clearly on the picture. The problem with this is anytime we're pulling signal out and subtracting stuff out from the waveform, we're also enhancing noise. So if you think about it, if I get rid of this, these signals here that provide my high frequency or whatever, I'm also increasing the noise, the overall amount of noise on the image, right? And it's just a percentage thing that as I'm subtracting out stuff that's actually signal, what remains is whatever remains of the signal plus whatever was there of the noise, right? So anytime I enhance the edge, for example, I will be enhancing the noise. So that, here's an example of just that. There's the original image. I applied a Fourier uh, uh, decomposition or a frequency domain operation to it for edge enhancement. And what I got is more pop. I can more clearly define where the fish's scales are, where um, the arch of its back is, where the, where the leaves meet the lake, but also the, the picture is more grainy. All right, that is all I've got for y'all, okay?